There is probably less known about the religions of Egypt than of any other major spiritual tradition which has contributed to the cultural progress of mankind. Until very recently, almost no available data opened itself to our attention or was available to scholars. Uh, the earlier material was largely derived from Greek or Latin sources, and the old Egyptian culture, which flourished prior to the 18th dynasty, is still a locked book. It reminds us a little of the rather deplorable state of our knowledge of ancient American religions. The cultures of Mexico, Central America, and Peru are still closed to us, with the exception of a few fragments, which give very little real insight into the structure of a religious belief. We observe the remains of the Egyptian Empire. We note the impressive monuments, the great architectural and artistic achievements of the people of the Valley of the Nile. We also note that a very large part of the surviving memorials are directly or indirectly associated with religion. These peoples created a magnificent religious art and architecture. And it seems reasonable to assume that these same people must have had some convictions or beliefs to justify the tremendous advancements which they made in science and even sociology. Their greatest exponents were the Greeks. And it would seem that during the classical period, Greek scholars never ceased their praise of Egyptian wisdom men of the caliber of Pythagoras and Plato, spoke most eulogistically of the spiritual attainments of Egypt. And in government and law, Solon and Thales bear witness to the common practice that men of learning and ability Faced with responsibility or high office, nearly always traveled to Egypt to be there instructed by the priests of the temple. Men who have given much time to Egyptian archaeology and culture, such as Breasted of the British Museum, uh, Breasted of the University of Chicago, and Budge of the British Museum, uh, both had a very high respect for Egyptian religion. But while Budge was working quietly in the shaded archives of the library of the British Museum and was curator of its Egyptian section, Another man in the same institution, Dr. Hall, probably working side by side with Drested from the same monument, from the same text, came to an entirely contrary conclusion. 
He was far from impressed by Egyptian religion. So here we find two men, the same background, working in the same institution, who have no common agreement. I think this is the general condition so far as Egypt is concerned. Let us try then, from what available information we have, to piece together some part of the Egyptian religious story. And when we begin this, we have to go back to the root of Egyptian culture. Here again, we are at a disadvantage. No one has exposed these roots. We really do not know where the great civilization of Egypt began in the pattern of history, nor do we know the source or roots of its spiritual beliefs. It is all right to assume, and we may have to, that these beliefs evolved, developed, and grew uh, with the rise of Egyptian civilization itself and that the primitive Egyptian, like the primitive Ashanti, held certain simple beliefs which gradually developed into the elaborate structures of the Middle Empire. On the other hand, there is much to suggest uh, that religion was imported to Egypt at a very early date. There seems a good many traces and evidences the point to Egypt's indebtedness to India, and probably to Persia, for a large part of its spiritual tradition. This may not have been at the very beginning, but it certainly did come into play prehistorically so far as existing monuments and records are concerned. The Egyptians themselves had a tradition that their religion came from Asia. There seems no real reason to question this tradition. For most people, if they can claim a belief to themselves, will not assign it to others. If the Egyptians really believed that their doctrines arose among their own people, they would certainly have held this honor to themselves. They did not do so, perhaps in honesty. They admitted their dependence upon foreign beliefs. Egypt, of course, was not isolated as China was, and in the course of time it felt religious influence from a number of surrounding sources of culture. It was affected certainly by the Assyrian and Babylonian culture, and at one time came heavily under the influence of the Semite culture. As time went on, the Egyptian metropolis of Alexandria uh, became an important station along the great caravan routes from Asia. We are not sure how early these caravan routes were opened, but certainly as early as 500 to 600 BC, probably much earlier. We know that far beyond Egypt, moving in an easterly direction, uh, we came upon a number of great cultures that were firmly established at a remote time. We do not know when China actually became a philosophic people, but we are reasonably certain that it was not later than 1500 to 2000 BC, probably earlier. We know that Indian culture is this old, if not older. We are quite confident, therefore, that Asia had produced advanced religious systems anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 B.C. These are the conservative figures of modern scholars, having no particular root in any speculation, mystical or otherwise. So there is no reason to doubt that along its life way, Egypt was heavily affected by the importation of outside ideas. 
It was open to them. It was not necessarily a particularly closed people. They were not uh, highly patriotic, as we think of the term. And as one authority points out, the one trait that seems to be traceable in all ancient Egyptian literature, religion, history, is that these people were happy. They were good-natured, cheerful lot, in spite of the various vicissitudes through which they passed. Like most strongly developed cultures, uh, they had certain freedoms even under powerful autocracies. The average person lived his own life in his own way. They were also people with considerable personal vanity, and many of these fashions which we now have originated among them. Uh, they believed in as much luxury as they were able to acquire, but at the same time they were hard working, and for the most part, uh, probably of what we would term an agricultural or agrarian class. Yet we cannot really uh, take it for granted that any people is able to maintain a cheerful and forthright optimism without some source of strength within itself. Uh, these people were not foolish, they were not ignorant, they were not stupid. Therefore, if they had a strong inner sense of value, it was derived from some powerful incentives operating within their own culture. We know very little also about the practice of Egyptian religion. We know only that there were priesthoods. That these priesthoods in the beginning were not very clearly marked, and their privileges were not uh, definitely uh, boundaried as they were at a later time. Uh, the priests of Egypt were not exactly uh, the uh, conventional archetype uh, of priesthood that we know today. Probably in the beginning, the priestly families uh, were associated with a theocratic state. The pharaoh was a living god. He was under divine guidance, and his deeds were always according to the divine right of kings. He was a god on earth, and somewhere in this mystery there must have been a god who was a pharaoh in heaven. Uh, this type of thinking belongs to most older people. In all probability, the priesthood was originally derived from the aristocracy. Uh, wealthy families and uh, friends, uh, near supporters of the political situation, uh, became influential in the religious duties. It was only after the rise of a very prosperous Egypt that this country set a precedent that was to be followed by most other cultures, namely that of assigning certain incomes to the temples. The temples, therefore, developed something the quality that we found in Tibet, where the secular uh, part of the culture supported the religious very strongly uh, and very generously. Uh, the temples of Egypt received income from certain lands of the state which were assigned to the temples. Therefore, as the conquest of Egypt expanded the empire, as trade enriched it, as commerce uh, brought to it a variety of commodities and luxuries, uh, the wealth of the temple lands increased until many of the temples were extremely rich. This wealth was not derived from the contributions of people as we think today in religion. It's very doubtful if the Egyptians ever took up a collection. What they did, rather, was to serve under a kind of uh, political protection or development. 
They were subsidized. This had its advantages, <coughs> this has its advantages and always has, in a country or in a political system where there's a state religion. This makes it unreasonable and unprofitable for the religion to cater to any passing whim or attitude. It is very hard to buy salvation from a temple that is not in need of money. It is also very difficult to think in terms of the purchasing of indulgences which caused poor old Martin Luther so much difficulty in Europe. The temple did not need money. This is always a very critical point in religious thinking. Also, there is no doubt that the temple did receive a great deal of unsolicited gifts. Uh, persons of all walks of life uh, felt it part of their normal and re reasonable and regular duty to enrich the temple. The gifts, however, were not usually monetary. They were gifts of art. They were gifts of things of sentimental, mystical, or spiritual value. Thus the temples became rich, not in money or things to be sold, but in the treasures that were assembled in these institutions. They need never think of selling the temple plate or anything of that nature. These problems uh, did not touch them any more than they touch the classical Greeks. As a result of this attitude, the function of the temple in society was rather different from what we know. It is not possible to learn uh, that religious services were held in any such way as we hold them. There were no congregations. Uh, there was no issue of the Sunday morning hymn program or anything of that nature. Uh, apparently, to each temple was assigned a learned body of priests. Uh, these priests were available to the people at all times. This was the simple framework of religion. The individual brought his spiritual need to an individual. He brought his need to a sanctified person who was bound by the obligations of secrecy, who might not be vowed, who might not bear witness against him, and had nothing whatever to gain uh, by lengthening or shortening the interview. If the person's problem took ten years to solve, it was no matter, because the priest was paid to do that particular thing, or subsidized to do it. He lived in the temple, he spent his uh, available time in prayer, meditation, thought, study, or perhaps in one of the various branches of teaching. Here we have something that descended again into the Arabic culture. Uh, in most cases, the Egyptian priest was an educator. He was also connected with the faculties of the priestly colleges. And uh, the temple was the college. It was the college, the hospital, the clinic, and in the matters of ordinary private living, it was also the judiciary. Almost all problems that did not relate to the actual political structure of the country uh, were handled by the religious educational group. In the uh, life of the Egyptian people, religion was a very present matter. All of the important events of life uh, had their religious observances, as they do today among primitive people. Uh, the various years of life, the changes which take place between childhood and adolescence, between adolescence and maturity, these changes were all marked with ritual. Uh, the Egyptian lived within a structure of ritual, and uh, the pageantry of it must have been most impressive. It provided him also, in all probabilities, with a large part of his local entertainment, because the festivals of the religion, the great celebrations, the processionals, uh, the various uh, 
sacred days and their observances, such as the intercalendary days upon which the first days of the gods were celebrated. All of these were set aside as festivals. Uh, the, in these festivals, the populace took some part, but they were also continuously uh, delighted observers of all the pomp and circumstance that went with these sacred occasions. Because of the very nature of the Egyptian religion, as it seems to have descended to us, it did not bestow upon its people any particular element of fear. Primitive religions usually do not. There may be certain negative fears arise around the ghost cults and things of that nature, but for the most part, the faiths of older peoples were cheerful. Uh, they uh, did not have to do uh, with any great fear or doubt concerning the future of things. Uh, the average individual perhaps was not too much concerned with e even the problem of his own survival after death. Certainly the populace in general either assumed that these matters were adequately taken care of by the great gods upon their distant thrones, or else all that was necessary to be known could be imparted to them by their priests and uh, in the various educational uh, facilities of the nation. We speak of Egyptian religion, but this itself is a more or less misnomer. Actually, the religions of Egypt were many, and at various times in the history of the nation, different sects and creeds emerged to powerful positions. Uh, probably this was partly due uh, to internal strife. Uh, from, there was much of this in the very early periods of Egyptian history. As a result of this strife, certain powerful uh, territories became dominant, others were conquered, and uh, this changed the religious outlook. Uh, the uh, victorious army imposed its religion upon the conquered. So that where a state or area came into great authority, its religion likewise developed a broad area of influence. The religions of Egypt were almost as numerous as the temples that housed them. In each community or city or province called a gnome in Egypt uh, had its own hierarchy of deities. Here again we find a close parallel with the ancient culture in the Greek area. Each city had its patron deity or group of deities, and the temples of these deities gathered around the central square or forum, much as they did in uh, Athens or in Rome. Thus, we cannot say that their theologies were always even nearly identical. One of the first problems that the modern Egyptologist faces in consideration of the religion of this country is the problem of the basis of the religious viewpoint of Egypt. Were the Egyptians monotheists, polytheists, or pantheists? In other words, did they worship one god? Did they worship many gods? Or did they worship embodied and personified aspects of nature. The tendency now for most uh, religious writers is to deny monotheism wherever possible, trying to reserve it as part of man's more modern spiritual acquirement. Actually, however, I strongly suspect that while Egypt probably had no collective monotheism, that is, at least in its early period, it did not recognize one god over all Egypt. I believe we will find that the gnomes, or various provinces, each recognized a supreme deity in their own pantheon. In other words, each of these separate systems worshipped 
uh, a certain group of deities, much like the Olympian gods, over this group one presided, as Zeus of, of the Greeks or Jupiter of the Latins. There seems to be much to indicate that these people were too advanced culturally uh, to avoid the natural concept that leadership must be invested in one power. But you cannot invest leadership in many powers of equal dignity and importance without chaos. You cannot do it in this world, and they did not believe it could be done in the universe. Somewhere in the universe there had to lurk this in mysterious leadership, this one power before which all other powers must bend in acceptance or obedience. Thus we may say that in Egypt the different areas had their own little religions with deities differently named from those of other gnomes. But in many instances, these different deities closely resembling each other, or in some instances, obviously derived from each other. As was the uh, practice of the time, the temple rose in the midst of the cultural life of the community. Uh, the temple uh, provided uh, the entire pattern of instruction. And it was usually architecturally so constructed as to serve a number of particular and special purposes. Uh, the open courts or the main parts of the temple were for public worship. They were also for uh, the enthronement of the divinities. Here in some way uh, the deities were represented, uh, usually uh, in uh, magnificent uh, granite or basalt figures. Nearly every one of these temples, by the way, presented their principal deities as a triad. Three divinities uh, in certain relationship with each other uh, constituted uh, the icons of the principal altar of the temple. In addition to this large assembly place, not so much where people gathered in great number, except on festive occasions, but rather where the gods themselves uh, were given ample homes with great dignity, mass, and majesty. In addition, there were smaller buildings scattered about uh, and adjacent to the larger sanctuary. These smaller buildings were the houses of the priests, the graveries, the treasure houses, and perhaps most of all, the schools and academies. Here learning was communicated. Here all knowledge, both sacred and secular, was revealed as one uh, essential structure of culture. In other words, the school was the preserver, recorder, and disseminator of the essential tradition of the province, or region, or area. Uh, because these uh, peoples did celebrate certain esoteric or secret rites to which the public was, was not admitted, meant for, in, for the most part that there were beneath these buildings subterranean rooms, passageways, tunnels, and other means of attaining to a secluded or hidden place. It is possible that in some instances where this subterranean situation was impractical due to the inundation of the Nile nearby, that these secret rooms were built upon the surface. But if so, uh, they were closed to the public and to the world and were entered only by secret doorways. In these sanctuary rooms, the particular and special instruction into the great rituals and rites of the gods 
were uh, communicated. This communication process was usually ritualistic. In other words, the great sacred dramas, as Plutarch calls them, were performed sometimes at night uh, in guarded places, including islands where privacy was assured. Or, uh, if not at night, then in the subterranean and hidden parts of the temple, uh, where the profane and the eavesdropper could not uh, penetrate. Thus we gradually distinguish, as in most instances among these older people, two divisions of religion, the one being that of the public ceremony, and the other that of the private instruction. This was a common policy throughout antiquity and uh, undoubtedly is responsible for the veneration in which the temple system was so long held. With the changes in the political life of Egypt, there was a more or less drawing together of the state. Uh, finally, Egypt came to be administered as a double empire of Upper and Lower Egypt and the authority of the state was vested in the pharaoh. Now, in the earlier periods, the pharaoh had a kind of nominal authority, but under a, um, an almost complete local system of autonomy. The pharaoh had certain prestige, precedent, authority, and power, uh, but it was largely located in his own city. Uh, he could call upon other areas, and they could not refuse his call. But he had very little to do with the shaping or reshaping of the cultural life of the various provinces. These provinces had their own uh, jealous patterns and traditions, which they would not relinquish to any central authority. In other words, in the early period, we might say that the federal government was weak. Uh, the uh, right of state uh, extended not only into politics but into religion. As time passed, however, the same thing occurred in Egypt that happens everywhere else, namely that these scattered autonomous states had to be drawn together. They could not defend themselves against the rising uh, tide of conquest from without the boundaries of the country. Uh, they could not properly unite in a social, political, or commercial uh, bond, and by degrees Egypt became essentially one country. In the process of so doing, there emerged from the galaxy of Egyptian faiths the one prominent and dominant religion of the people. A religion, however, that was never uh, the only religion. Uh, there, were to the, there was to the very end of Egyptian autonomy the continuance of these various temples, these various shrines, and these various hierarchies of divine beings. But in the course of time, the cult of Osiris uh, began to uh, overwhelm all other religions like a great light rising and causing innumerable candles uh, to lose their own peculiar radiance. And uh, by a thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era, uh, the Osirian cult came to become uh, almost the idea of Egyptian religion. It became the archetypal concept to which nearly all later people subscribe, so that when we think of Egyptian religion today, we are inclined to think of the Osirian cult. This cult was originally the, the belief of one of the less influential gnomes or provinces. But as this province gained in authority, influence, and power, its deities gained likewise. Now, why was it, perhaps, that this particular faith 
seem to meet the need of the Egyptians to the degree that throughout the entire empire it came to be tolerated at least and generally embraced. I think the answer lies in the fact that the rise of the Osirian cult uh, was associated with a major change in Egyptian religious philosophy. It must have answered and did answer certain questions otherwise obscure. The priesthood of Osiris gained also in authority and influence until it became the most powerful religious body in Egypt. And it became uh, mandatory that the pharaoh of Egypt himself be initiated into the Osirian rites. It was uh, the, uh, gradually it became the state mysteries. Uh, the religion which had the greatest uh, prominence, precedence, and authority in the life of the people. There is a department of religion uh, with which most people are not too well informed and about which there is not too much generally available, and that is called eschatology. This particular branch of religious thinking deals with what might be termed the end of things. In religion, uh, every phase of human experience has to lead to something. And uh, the problem of the ultimate state of things actually is essentially a religious problem. We have tried to make it a scientific problem, but we have only ended by making religion out of science. We have to have certain concepts. Eschatology, for example, asks these questions. What is the end of the world? Uh, what is the end of man? What is the state of man after death? What is the ultimate condition of the soul? These things all have to do with some kind of termination or something that lies beyond uh, the circle of the immediate or even uh, the less immediate. We have to go into the state of ultimates, and the problem of spiritual ultimates is uh, covered by the general theme of eschatology. Now, in the Osirian rite of Egypt, we must expect uh, to find a new a concept of ultimates, and I suspect that this was the power and uh, influence particularly uh, responsible for the rise of the state. In the cult of Osiris, we find, for example, the gradual rise of a powerful monotheistic principle. Now, it does not mean that Osiris uh, was technically and actually, in Egyptian religious philosophy, the supreme deity. But by degrees, Osiris became the supremely important deity, the deity uh, most necessary to man, the deity that held in its power and authority the ultimate of man. Also, the Osiris cult had other answers, answers relating to problems that confronted ancient man and which he, to a measure, is still struggling with even today, and that is the problem of the immortality of the human soul. In the uh, Osirian cult, the immortality emerges. It emerges as a spiritual certainty. This, in a way, divides Egypt even from Greece, for immortality arose perhaps later in Greek thinking than it did in Egyptian thinking. The old Egyptians of, say, a thousand B.C., who had no clear notion of immortality. Uh, they realized that something probably survived, but to them the answer was the ghost land. 
uh, to the earliest Egyptian with an instinct for survival, it seems to have been believed that the dead lived on in their tombs. And for that reason, their worldly goods were buried with them so that they would have everything necessary for their pleasure and convenience. That uh, there was a, a real sense of immortality, as we conceive it today, uh, is doubtful prior to the rise of the Osirian cult. It was probably locally taught wherever this cult dominated before it became the principal faith of the empire. The rise of the Osirian cult may also have been strongly influenced by the brief but powerful spiritual impulse given by Akhenaten. This Thario, living probably between 13 and 1400 BC, certainly was a powerful monotheist. He was one who distinctly and definitely held the concept of one God. Apparently, Egypt at that time was not ready for him, and as a result, his monotheism did not have an endurance. It did survive, however, in mystical and religious groups, and seems to have finally contributed to the ultimate integration of the Osirian cult. So we have in the, in the deity Osiris, many of the attributes and aspects that we would normally associate with a supreme being. First of all, we have in him that which is one of the high marks of an ethical civilization, namely a good God. In this case, a good God is one in whom virtues exist that are beyond the common practice of the believers or followers of that God. In other words, Osiris was perhaps cast in the image of man, but he was better than man. He was not merely a stronger chief. He was a nobler ruler. Thus, in Egypt, we begin to clearly observe the rise of the concept of spiritual nobility. That is, the rise in the, of the belief that man lives to become better than he is. This is quite an important uh, point which we take for granted, but we cannot assume was present among ancient beliefs. Uh, gradually also into the Osiris cult came another uh, important element, probably derived partly from Akhenaten, partly from Syria, and partly from Persia. This was the belief that Osiris was not only the good God, but he was a God who loved his children. And furthermore, that men, mortals, humans, were the beloved children of this God, who now takes on the father attribute. He is no longer a God with slaves. He is a father with sons. Now this thought uh, is still hard for some people to reconcile in true philosophic insight. We all claim to think this, but in our relationships with life and with religion, we are much more inclined still to think of deity as the autocrat. But in Egypt, the followers of the cult of Osiris began to think of him not only as the good god, but as the wise God, the kindly God, and most of all, in the rise of their religion, the forgiving God. Here, then, we have nearly all of the elements of a highly advanced theological system. We have a deity who emerges as a power, a universal power for good that in the great struggle of the ages, this good must come to ultimate victory. We have the God of, of wisdom, in whose nature all mysteries are known, all secrets have their roots, all realizations and revelations originate. 
We have the deity who has a warm and continuing affection for his creation. And also, as we learn from the various magical manuscripts, the God who understands his creation, so that if men are weak or inadequate, this deity understands this. He is not the cold, stone-faced image against the temple wall. He is the searcher into the hearts of things. He is the fana of breath in the soul. In addition to these things, this deity is constantly laboring for the ultimate uh, perfection of man, or the rescuing of the world from a state of evil. Undoubtedly, the Egyptians strengthened their philosophy of sin by uh, deriving a certain amount of borrowings from the Semitic people. They also strengthened their belief in the war between good and evil from the doctrines of the Persians. So we have now the good god Osiris, wise and loving, but not all-powerful, who is locked in a bitter struggle uh, with his own brother, Typhon, the destroyer. The struggle of good and evil for victory over the life of man. This is anthropomorphism, a belief which, of course, has been for centuries one of the dominant doctrines of the Christian faith. The struggle of good and evil. But now the eschatology in Egypt says good will vanquish evil. So legends, myths, and fables arose among these people, bearing upon the ultimate victory of good over evil. Now the next point that comes uh, into the Egyptian consciousness of Osiris is that Osiris is the lord of the underworld. Osiris is the sun at night. Osiris, therefore, is in some way an embodied deity, represented often wrapped in the wrappings of a mummy, so that he appears to be a living head rising out of a dead body. He is, therefore, the symbol of life-death. He is the symbol of the material world or universe over which he rules, and of which he is the demiurgus or the sovereign power. Osiris now begins to be represented with his attributes, attributes which were to have a great effect upon the religions that followed after him. Standing or seated in his mummified form, wearing his plumed helmet, the crowns of the north and south. Osiris also carries uh, the symbolical ceremonial objects or instruments associated with his faith. These are, first, the flail. The flail, or the whip, was then used primarily not as a symbol of beating or scourging men, but as a symbol of the flailing of grain. It was used to divide the grain from the husk. Therefore, as the flailer, or the beater, Osiris represented uh, the power that divides the false and true, divides the valuable from that which is not valuable, and also divides the soul from the body. The second instrument which he carries is the Anubis-headed staff, by which he is the patron of knowledge or learning, and carries with him the symbol of the faithful guide. Therefore, in this symbolism or this emblemism, Osiris becomes the patron of education, the patron of all knowledge, the patron of insight, the lord of arts and sciences, and he bestows his blessing upon knowledge. In other words, mathematics, astronomy, music, law, medicine, 
These are also phases of the Osirian cult. He is the Lord of all these things. He is the Lord of the quick and the dead. And by this authority, he governs minds. He governs and regulates people. He establishes laws. He sets up the machinery of the universe. Then by his third implement, of sacred symbolism, the shepherd's crook, or crozier. Osiris emerges as the high priest, the good shepherd. He is the keeper of the flocks. He is the symbol, therefore, of the protector of the faith, a term which was later bestowed upon the royalties of Europe. He is now the shepherd of men. He is the guardian of the flocks of creation. The world is his sheepfold. He is the shepherd, and all creatures are the sheep. And he also becomes responsible for the lost sheep. And it is his labor and duty through his priests, who are his shepherds, to bring back the lost sheep to the fold. Now, this did not mean reconversion to anything in Egypt because there was only within a certain province one faith and all belonged to it. But it was rather to bring back the unbeliever from the evil of his ways or if he had failed in his religious observances, you know, to bring him back again to the concept of these observances. Uh, as I think I've told you before, I just I talked this over in New York several years ago with the uh, ecumenical patriarch of the Eastern Church, who appears in his full robes and vestments uh, as the head of the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church, carrying the symbols and insignia of Egypt. And he told me himself, he said, we all know in the Eastern Church that most of our symbolism, our symbolic instruments, our robes, our vestments, and many of our re regulations and ceremonies are derived directly from the religion of the ancient Egyptians. Now this goes a little further because the Osirian cult gradually unfolds other attributes uh, that are important to us. For in the Osirian religion, the endless conflict between light and darkness, the struggle between Osiris and Typhon for the control of the world, results in the emergence in the Egyptian cult of the world hero. This is the world hero also of the Sigurd Saga of the Nordic peoples. This is the great race of the Valsun, the race uh, of the heroes of the world. In the Osirian cult, we have, therefore, the arising of the hero concept, uh, in which this power, this eternal being, Osiris, in order to advance the redemption of men, projects himself into the mortal world, coming forth out of the shadows of Amentech taking himself a flesh of body and being revealed or made manifest through his own nature in the form of an only begotten son. Therefore, in, o in Egypt, Horus, the only begotten of the father, the son of the widow, the most mysterious and immaculately conceived, uh, born of Isis, who was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit of her own murdered husband, Osiris, gave, uh, uh, gave Horus the power to bear witness to his own father throughout all worlds. And in the Egyptian ritual, it bears definitely stated that whoever has seen Osiris has seen his son, and whoever has seen his son has seen Osiris. For the Father is in the Son, and the Son is in the Father unto everlastingness. So the projection 
of Osiris himself comes forth to be the redeemer of men in the form of Horus, the golden hawk. This golden hawk perhaps also derives from the idea of the phoenix. Horus not only becomes the avenger of his father, ultimately restoring the empire to his father, but he also becomes the intercessor, the one who, having taken flesh, having lived among men, and having known the sorrows and secret pains of men, asks that the Father will be patient of men, because he has sent his own Son among them to be like unto them. And Osiris nearly always heeds the voice of his Son. And when his son uh, asks or requests, the father generally is symbolically represented as acceding to that request. Now this gives us uh, a very strong foundation for the doctrine of redemption, which was certainly taking form in Egypt uh, by the very earliest contact between uh, the Egyptians and the Latins. Now, out of this comes also another important doctrine rising in the cult of Osiris, and that is the concept of intercession. Here we have now uh, Osiris in, in his own proper right, and Osiris as the extension of himself in his own son. His son gradually becomes, therefore, uh, the peacemaker, the prince of peace, uh, to whom the father will deny nothing. But Osiris now stands in another relationship to this projection of himself. Horus becomes the scapegoat. And in the rituals of the coming forth by day, if the soul which has sinned is in doubt of salvation, Horus steps forth and pleads with his father Osiris, saying, Let the sins of this man come upon me. Let me be therefore the bearer of his sin. And in my name, and because I have accepted his sin, I ask that you shall forgive him. Now here we have intercession. We have also in this very same uh, concept, as we find in the Egyptian ritual, by the transference of the virtues of Osiris to Horus, and the transference again of these virtues uh, to his priests, who in turn transferred these virtues by their form of the Eucharist, we have rising in Egypt uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation. Thus we now have in this people, and I would say it would be at least a thousand B.C. that this pattern took fairly integrated form, for it is present everywhere in the Theban recension of the Book of the Dead. We have now what might be termed a reasonably complete theology. We have the beginnings of ideas that were to gradually spread to all other parts of the world. And we begin to see how it would be inevitable that this type of thinking would also result in the rise of a mysticism. This is really the crux of our problem. Because in the study of mysticism, we then come straight head-on into the problem of the Egyptian mysteries. And of course, as might be expected, our more materialistic manuscript, a rich and full and complete version of the book of the coming forth by day. Here we find the priest army pictured at the beginning of the scroll. But he has died. Therefore, we find the inscription reading, Osiris, who was Ani. 
Oh, uh, this occurs frequently in the manuscript. Or the reverse formula. Ani, who is Osiris. Thus, we have an identification that is very important, namely that at death, the soul of man becomes God. Now, where would this have come from? There is only one possible answer that we have at the present time, and that would be Middle Asia. For here we would find that perhaps at the same time that we are concerned with, the idea of that the Atman, or supreme power of the universe, existed in all things, and that the spirit or life in every living thing is God. And that when the body is removed, or the being departs from the body, it is in one way or another hallowed or glorified. We know that uh, at the time of the papyrus of Adi, therefore, that the soul or spiritual content within the nature of Adi was Osiris. That all souls passing out of the body were Osirified. That is, uh, they became one with Osiris. They were restored again to him. Egyptian metaphysics seems to point out, therefore, that in a mysterious way, Osiris is the world soul. We have already mentioned that he was not the supreme deity, because he was the lord of the underworld. And this would be perfectly consistent with the idea of the world psyche being the lord of the mortal world. And that in the soul experience of living things, the souls of all separate beings are ultimately restored to the world soul. And that therefore Osiris is the shepherd of souls. And that the, uh, that the place of peace or of survival, representing either, either the paradise to come or the assembly of the initiates in this world, was properly denominated the peaceful or the place for the gathering of the sheep. So we have now uh, this concept also, Eric, that in each human being there is an Osiris. That this Osiris, perhaps, therefore, can be compared to Paul's ecstatic utterance, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. This idea of the indwelling divinity is rather unique for its period in the doctrine of the Middle Egyptians. The next point that we uh, find, in the, again, in the eschatology of the situation, is the description of the world in which Osiris rules. He rules in a wonderful temple located in the other where, not here but somewhere else. He rules, therefore, in a temple beyond the common dimension of our concept. This temple is, according to some reports, standing in the midst of the underworld, in the world of dreams, in the world of the subconsciousness of things. But it is this otherworldness in which it exists. This otherworldness to which all must come by the mystery of death, and the otherworldness from which all things came in the mystery of birth. So we now have a world and another world. And this one world that we see and in which we live to move and have our being is a kind of world of the diurnal sun which is the light of the world. This otherworldness is the world of the nocturnal sun. And in Egyptian metaphysics, we begin to see that this other sun is the light within us, the soul light. 
that as surely as we are lighted outwardly by the sun, moon, and stars, so we are lighted inwardly by the sun which is Osiris. Now, Osiris is usually in the various manuscripts represented seated and enthroned upon a cube rock or a perfect cube which symbolizes the world. Very often he wears a tap to the rear of his robe the tail of a lion, uh, which is an attribute associated with the Sphinx which suggests the androgynous nature of the deity in Egyptian thinking. His body is represented mummified. His hands, however, are free, holding the implements we have previously mentioned as he is found. Not infrequently, he is represented as black. Sometimes, however, as red. With him are his sister wives, Isis and Neptune. A symbolic of the triad of the hierarchy, which at that time consisted of Osiris, Isis, and Neptune, the great Osirian triad. Uh, the room in which he is seated is called the Hall of the Twin Truth, and it is bounded at each end by a tall column, white or new. These two columns are the columns of the underworld, described in the Greek mystical literature. And these columns also are the columns of the porch of the temple of Solomon the king. And Osiris is therefore thrown between a black and a white column, which symbolize life and death, light and darkness, reality and illusion. Osiris is furthermore thrown in a mentex, or in a menti. And a mentex is the paradise, or the paradiso, of other worlds. He is seated in a celestial, invisible, psychical equivalent of Egypt. In this other worldness, the Elysian field, there is also a river Nile flowing down slowly to the Mediterranean Sea. There is also the un inundation of the Nile. And here the Egyptian in the other world is leading his plow through the muddy waters by the riverbank. Here in this other world are also birds singing in the rushes by the river. The papyrus plant blossoms in grandeur, and also there are lakes and streams, there are all the good things here, men uh, who have passed the test of life, uh, live in peace and prosperity and worship the great God. Now, this might seem a little primitive to some of us as a description of other world myths, but it is it very much more primitive than a city with four walls, uh, with a foundation of precious stones, and gates on each side. It is not so much different. It is only a problem of how far can we penetrate into the symbolism in either case. Are we talking about something desperately literal, or are we trying to understand a mystery, as in the mystery of the city four squares that forth in the revelation of St. John. So here in the underworld, in his city four squares, sits the great deity, judge of the alive and the dead. And here in the crypt beneath the Egyptian temple, the great rite of the opening of the mouth was to fall. Well, we have to try to uh, reconstruct as we can the circumstances that would lead up to the use of this ritual. We know that as set forth in the papyrus of Ani, that this must have been a strange and splendid thing. Restorations made in England at the British Museum have been able to piece together 
that might be termed the ritualistic context. We know that this particular ritual is dramatically suitable for theatrical production. We also know, as Professor Breston told me in Chicago, that there are existing manuscripts, papyri, of the book of the coming forth by day, in which the prompters mark for action, and their exits and entrances are marked on the mar margins of the manuscript. There is no doubt it was a theatrical production. But the circumstances under which it was given, and why it was given, might still be subject to some thought. One parallel immediately suggests itself, whether it is in India, China, Egypt, Persia, Greece, or Rome. The, the ceremonies associated with death were always also associated with the initiation ritual. The rite for the uh, initiation of candidates in the mystery were always rites associated with the mortuary procedure. The purpose of this was obvious to be reasonably well informed. Uh, the purpose of initiation was to carry the individual by consciousness from one world to another. This also was the inevitable function of death. Therefore, just as surely as man by initiation becomes aware of his own immortality, so by death he gains this awareness. He stands as the Egyptian said, I am dead, yet I do not die. This is a discovery, the fact of which, apparently, is reserved for only two possible conditions. One is religious mysticism, and the other is death itself. So the mortuary ritual is always the initiation ritual. Now, when would such a ritual be used, and uh, why? Two answers to this. First, it is quite conceivable that this tragically would be literally uh, portrayed in the case of the death of the pharaoh. In other words, the, the funerary uh, processes in connection with the death, perhaps, of the pharaoh or his queen or perhaps some very high officer of the household in the case of an exceptional or extraordinary person, the ritual might be either privately or publicly performed over the actual remains of the dead. Under such conditions, the ritual would then have to be modified because it would not be and could not be expected that the actual thought could deliver the great negative confession of faith. Therefore, to the body would have to be associated a living attendant to speak for the body and to act as the intermediary again between the living and the dead. And this intermediary should be either Anubis or Horus himself. Therefore, there is the possibility that the ritual was given as an actual mortuary rite. There would be no reason then to doubt that an Egyptian of lesser estate who could not afford or was not entitled by the caste system of his time uh, to any such elaborate ritual might then be interred with a manuscript copy, uh, as was commonly talismanically done. With the idea or concept that he would then have available to him all of the passwords of the degree, all of the keys to the various gates of the divisions of the underworld that he might know the answers and the proper deportment when he entered into the presence of the great gods in the hall of the twin trees. These things were, therefore, interred with him, along with other uh, materials which might be of use to him. It was customary, for instance, 
to, in, uh, to incur with a scribe, his stylus, and his writing tablet. He was not quite certain who he would write to, but at the same time, this was ceremonialism. He might feel, while resting quietly in the tomb, an irresistible desire to make a few notes. If such was the case, he must have the necessary equipment. Therefore, in your magical uh, belief, the moment you assume uh, that the soul has an existence apart from the body, you may assume that this soul has some continuance in living, and may have, therefore, interests uh, like or similar to those of the living person in this world. The second use of the religious ritual, as in the case of the Egyptian mystery, would be uh, the pure problem of, a, of initiating a living person into the mysteries of the other world. This would be a ceremonial. It would be very much in the order of an ordination or a, a high mass performed uh, to stimulate the spiritual power of the observer. The Egyptians definitely believe in a mnemonic system. That is that by presenting the soul of the living person with a certain spectacle about divine matter, the soul within the person would be aroused, would leap forth in joy to behold that which was its own nature, or would hold upon the truth revealed, because these truths were already sleeping in the soul. Therefore, that through the ceremony, the sleeping truth in the soul would be awakened and the person would have the experience of knowing the mystery behind the ritual. In either instance, then, the right could be conceived to have been ceremonially uh, portrayed, and the proper place for such ceremony would certainly be in the subterranean passages uh, of the temple, or in some place isolated or in some place of darkness away from the common convention of man, because this place must represent other worldness. We have gradually developed in uh, Western religion a practice or policy of placing crypts under cathedrals for the burial of the sanctified dead. Uh, the Egyptians did not follow this practice. But they also definitely did use their crypts or subterranean rooms to represent the world of the dead. The practice which we find among the Latins in the old catacombs of Rome long before the rise of Christianity. So if these rites were given, as Plutarch tells us, they were certainly given nocturnally because they related to darkness not by nature of evil, but by nature of hiddenness, that they related to the sun of the soul which shines in the night. And as Apelius describes in his initiation into the mystery, he says that it was at night that he placed his foot upon the threshold of Persephone and beheld the sun shining through the earth beneath his feet. These rituals, then, were the rituals of the night sun, they were the rituals of Osiris, uh, the mysterious deity of the subconscious. And it was in, uh, in these rites that something within the subconscious of the experience of man was stimulated. I suspect that uh, Egyptologists are going to have to gradually take, it, uh, take on and accept the psychological significance of ritualism. They're going to have to realize that uh, this type of psychic simulation is archetypal, and that rituals were gradually revelations of the subconscious, perhaps given at one primitive time through dreams and visions. But certainly, they have a reach in the folk consciousness of man. 
And from this consciousness, they call forth something when they are repeated or correctly performed. So for a moment we will attempt to restore some of this concept in the idea of the initiation, perhaps we can say, of Adi, tribe of Pharaoh. Now we do not need to assume necessarily that Adi is dead, but in the manuscript that accompanied his mummy in the sarcophagus, this manuscript certainly implies that he has passed into the Amenta. Your eschatology again comes to the forward, however. What happens to the soul of Adi, who is a siren? Uh, does this soul uh, rest forever in the uh, paradisical abode of the great God, or does it come forth again? Uh, in the, by the time of the rise of the Assyrian sect, it seems that rebirth had already invaded Egypt as a concept. The improbabilities are that uh, the eschatology in Egypt finally centers upon the idea of Calendonesia, or of the uh, various uh, returns, renovations, restorations of the rising of the soul from its own dead. Uh, the Greek concept of metempsychosis. So we will say that either Ani as the dead or Ani as the candidate is prepared for the ritual of the coming forth by day. If he is alive and is a neophyte to the temple, it appears that he was initiated singly that there were no deep initiations on this level, although there were what were called the orgies of the gods. And in those days, the word orgy did not have a negative implication. It now merely meant ceremony. It did not mean dissipations of any kind. The tie between our present thought and the old word is ecstatic. It was the ecstasy or the enthusiasm from entheus in God. It was a divine ecstasy. But gradually in the Roman line, or Roman world, it began to be confused with the Bacchanalia, which was not its original meaning. But in any event, uh, the candidate, accompanied by a guide, appointed for this purpose, enters uh, into the temple, is met by the priest with torture, and is led downward. Either he is led actually downward, or symbolically the idea and concept of a descent is implied to him. I would suspect that in most cases some form of a descent was actually made. Perhaps only a few feet, perhaps 25 or 50 feet. But he was taken downward through darkness. And at various intervals along the road, he was stopped and interrogated. And because he was as yet unenlightened in these mysteries, he was vouched for and taken forward by his guide, the one that was appointed. So finally, after certain adventures and mysteries associated with symbolism, and if the temple was exceedingly well equipped, uh, including a boat ride across a subterranean stream, and this subterranean stream might have been only a pond or pool, and possibly the boat maybe took only three or four strokes of the oar to cross it. But this was essential, because even in those days, the land of the gods was on the other shore. Uh, the, the, uh, the river by which souls in this life are divided from the souls in the other life is the same as the river Styx in the Greek mystery, or the mysterious celestial Jordan, on whose farther shore we are to meet in everlasting bliss, according to the ancient hymn of Christianity. Having reached the other shore in this Having passed the veil of the mystery, 
between this world and the next. The candidate for initiation is conducted into the great hall of the spring sheep, which is brilliantly lighted with candles or tapers or torches, probably originally uh, with torches made of thongs of wood. Uh, this uh, room uh, was well filled, for here were gathered all of the persons involved in the great rite. Seated on the elevated throne was Osiris, probably wearing a, gla a, wearing a mask of gold, and uh, fully uh, equipped with all of the symbols of his rank and office. He was accompanied also by Isis and Neptune. Isis wearing upon her head the empty stone to symbolize the martyrdom of her husband, and Neptune bearing upon her head the symbol of a bowl to carry consecrated water. Before the uh, throne of Osiris, the scales of the Psychostasia had been set up for the great ceremony of the weighing of the soul. The Sinocephalus ape sat upon the balance of the scales. So Hermes, Trismegistus, the recorder of the gods with a mask with the Ida's head, stood holding his scales, uh, the, uh, the stylus and the writing tablet. Anubis with the head of the jackal was there. Uh, Horus was also present with the golden head of a hawk. Along one wall was gathered the 42 assessors representing the jury of the dead. There was present also Typhon, the destroyer, because in this heavenly uh, accumulation or assembly, the spirit of negation must also be. Likewise present was Mayak, the goddess of justice. Represented as either blindfolded or without eyes, or wearing a mask without eyes, also wearing upon her head the ostrich plume of the law. In addition to these less present, it also now be included uh, Adi, the Ezosiris. He comes in, raises his two hands at right angles upward and forms the sign of the ka, the symbol of the soul. He says, I am a soul. And the form of his body in the ritual makes the hieroglyph to symbolize that he is unbodied, that he is a living soul that has achieved freedom from body. Now this may mean either that he is dead and therefore has departed from body, or that by the study, mysticism, religion, and philosophy of the temple, he has achieved the release of his soul from the delusion of body. In any way, he speaks of the victory of the soul or life over the body by the position of his hand. He is then led forward into the presence of this assembly of the gods. And here he is presented with the negative confession of faith. In this particular case, uh, the assessors or the jurors present the various articles of the negative confession. Or the herald of the court, St. Hermes, may himself read the sacred uh, liturgy of the question. Uh, it is said that the Egyptian was a proud man. Uh, that he would not accept a positive confession of faith. He would not end his confession uh, by saying, uh, I have. He would only uh, finish it by saying, I have not. Therefore, the questions are all so stated that the answer, the positive answer, is I have not. So then begins the interrogation of the soul of Osiris who was Ami. And in the course of interrogation, uh, the assessors, the jurors, and the great God who reads all minds and hearts remain silent while the deceased person or the novice seeking initiation is interrogated. This interrogation 
is probably one of the most important ethical monuments in the philosophy of mankind, for it represents in its substance a code so extraordinarily high that it is doubtful if any person today uh, could answer it correctly and uh, with integrity all of these questions uh, and assume that he had lived what they required. Also in the negative confession, we find a great many uh, ideas of good and ill, which are quite advanced, in fact, far further advanced than our own code. Because this uh, code definitely judges the individual, not only by his actions, by his words, by his deeds, but by his most intimate thoughts, by his deepest convictions by the most secret of his purposes. Also, he is judged by the very abstract motive behind the things that he has done. He is also uh, expected to be able to state clearly that he has not been jealous of any other living being throughout life, that he has said no untrue word about any person either in seriousness or in jest, that he has never taken from any person anything that that other person did not give for you. Now, that would be pretty tough, even in the 20th century. It's getting tougher every day, we might add. Also, we know that the Egyptian was one of the few people who listed the psychological mistakes that we make that uh, the negative confession infers that the individual must have conquered fear within himself. Not the fear of the known, but the fear of the unknown. That he must have transcended all doubt about universal good. That he must be free from excessive grief. That he must be free from excessive Worry that he must have in himself no negative quality uh, which would in any way defile the Osiris in his own soul. Well, uh, several writers and students of the matter have come to the conclusion that uh, the Egyptian, either living or dead, that took this examination, had to, we'll say, okay, somewhat exaggerate his virtue, uh, and perhaps overlook a few mistakes along the line. But in the, in the ritualism, although he is honest, and in the right, the candidate does admit his mistakes. He does not attempt to give all positive answers. He does not claim to be without fault. This is, in fact, part of the ritual itself. For when the confession of the faith, the confession of faith is finished, and the negative confession has been completed, uh, there is, in all present, a certain doubt as to whether the candidate for this honor, or uh, this uh, recognition of a spiritual being, is truly justified. Uh, at that time also, the part of the, of the Osiris Sikwadani is placed upon one balance of the scale, and the goddess Maya takes her feather, the symbol of law, universal law, and places it on the other balanced pan. If the two pans of the scale balance, if the heart is, is balanced with truth, if uh, all the uh, laws of nature balance the heart, then it is assumed that the Osiris Kivadani is true and noble. This is the final test. 
But in the testing, the balance is not quite perfect. And the heart of the Osiris Sikwadani cries out from a little lip in the side of the jar, which is supposed to contain his mummified heart. And this voice cries out to the great god Osiris. He says, Father of all good, permit not that I shall perish with the king who ruleth for a day. Now, the king who ruleth for a day is obviously inclined or intended to represent the personality. It is the outer or personal material ego of the individual. It is this which has been weighed and tried in the balance of the apocalypse day and has been found wanted. Therefore, the cry of the soul goes up, but it shall not die with the king who ruleth for a day. And the assessors are very solemn. The great jurors of the dead must contemplate the virtues and vices of this soul as to whether it shall be able to enter into the blessedness of a mentor. And in this emergency, Horus steps forward. And Horus says, I intercede for this soul. If this soul's virtues are not entirely equal uh, to the law we know. Uh, but I offer myself as hostage for this soul. And if this soul shall fail, let the failure be upon me. If this soul is not worthy, let me be punished. Let my virtues be placed with the virtues of this soul upon the spirit. And with my virtues added, the balance will be made. And uh, the God Osiris meditates upon this problem for the moment, with silence and with lofty soul, and seems not entirely convinced even then. And Horus uh, speaks to him again and says to him, O oh, my father, who is myself? Thy son, who is thyself, asks thee. To refuse me is to refuse your own heart. Therefore, there is again silence. The assessors consider the matter. And finally, the verdict is brought in. But the soul, plus the love of God, has made the balance. The soul is then permitted to pass into the realms of the blessed. Now the theory is contained in the ritual. That is, for some reason, this soul entering in is so corrupted that it cannot make the balance. And that Osiris, under these conditions, rejects the sacrifice of his own son who offers himself as a peace offering unto the Lord. If the soul fails utterly, then Titan sets forth. The deity represented with the head of a crocodile and the body of a horse, and claims the soul. And if this soul is released to Titan, Titan then devours the soul and carries the soul away into darkness where it is believed or supposed that the soul passes back into re-embodiment. For Typhon is the symbol of the mud hog of the Nile, the symbol of utter materiality. And therefore, to be swallowed up by Python is to be reborn in the physical world. It is now assumed, however, that the successful candidate has passed the test with the assistance 
of Torah. Therefore, the successful candidate approaches his father. The soul comes into the presence of the immediate light of the golden face of the sun. And Osiris holds forth the key to the world and bestows this key as a symbol of everlasting grace. And the key, of course, is the cross Samsata, the unfated cross of Egypt, the cross with a loop for an upper bar. And when this cross is placed upon the lips of the deceased or the initiate, it is a symbol of the life bestowed, the symbol of the forgiveness of all evil, and that the candidate or the soul has been given the gift of everlasting life. Now, it, is, it remains for Osiris to bestow this, for the life of everlastingness is not automatically the result of the passing the ritual. The life of everlastingness must be given or awarded to the soul by Osiris. But when Osiris so does this, this correct samsata becomes the word of the life and the resurrection. And having been sealed with this, the soul passes triumphantly to its just reward, goes triumphantly to that better life which is its proper estate. Now it is quite understandable that a ritual of this kind would have very deep transcendental import, especially if it is something that is held and deeply believed by all who witness it. The candidate undoubtedly had been instructed in the temple prior to initiation, or the deceased uh, army, uh, the scribe of Pharaoh, was well informed in the state religion. They had passed to a certain degree of comprehension. They knew the meaning of the ritual. And we are then in the same condition almost as we might uh, say the individual is who takes the Eucharist or the ordination of a priest. In each instance, that which is to occur is known in advance. But by some mystery of transubstantiation, these physical things become peculiarly related to metaphysical truths beyond themselves. And it is to be assumed, therefore, that the initiate, having received this mystery, was in some way internally altered. That with this faith, with this participation in the highest and most secret rites of his people, uh, with this best blessing and benediction of the high elephant of the mysteries, who undoubtedly impersonated Osiris, that more than a mere drama was intended as in the elevation of the host at high mass to the believer there is a spiritual mystery. But this mystery uh, bestows some alteration, some change, like the laying on of hands in the apostolic succession. But there is something by which all things are made new by a mystery of faith itself, by a mystery of religion itself. And if these people were raised, particularly those eligible for the sacred issue, in a philosophic atmosphere, 
have been educated by a system of culture in which religion was the lord over all the arts and sciences, and in which the achievement of the sanctified life was the most important of all achievements, and that as the candidate, the initiate might wait for years until the hierophant regarded him as qualified and worthy for this extraordinary honor. We cannot but doubt that in the religion in which the priest himself was the very extension of his God, where these things were really and deeply and concisely believed, that some type of profound psychological experience took place. Plato describes it, others have described it. Aquilius uh, tells all that he dares to tell it. But according to the reports of these witnesses, at the moment of the great initiation, all these mortal elements vanish. The uh, figure seated upon the throne with the golden mask was no longer the priest. He was a father. Something happened within the person accepting the ritual. Some light blazed from within himself. And as Aquila says, all of these priestly persons were suddenly radiant. They became the very beings that they represented. Perhaps the priests themselves did not even know this. But in the heart and soul of the initiate, some kind of an internal experience occurred, by which he was no longer the subterranean room of an ancient temple. He was in the mysterious underworld of Osiris, and in a kind of hypnotic trance or ecstasy, in the strange exhilaration of the greatest religious experience that he could conceive, this person was suddenly touched by a great cleansing, so that never again was he quite the same person. A stage has been set for him by which he is actually enabled to pass through a mystical experience. Everything was right in the psychology and chemistry of his own conscience. And in the supreme moment of the ritual, all of the ceremonies suddenly became real. And in that instant of reality, the person lost all human dimension. He was Osiris. He was in the presence of the great psychic principle of the world. Perhaps it was in this moment of the unfoldment of his own psychic center that he was aware of this experience. But someday, in the course of time, perhaps, we will understand the psychic life of man better, and we will realize that such experiences can occur, that they do not have to be delusions, that perhaps they do represent a tremendous spiritual inward realization by which things are transformed in a mystery. But in this mystery, we have the very substance of mysticism and the spirit. This, as far as we can carry it in our modern world knowledge, tells us something of the religion of the Egyptians. And I believe it tells us something of rather import, of rather psychological import to us now in our own question as to the reality lie behind the shadows of a pyramid. In some way, the Egyptian was able to pierce this appearance through his ritual. And perhaps uh, we will ultimately regain the understanding of this if we consider psychological research in the terms of religious experience.
Well, I guess our time is up, so we'll have to let it rest until next week. And we will take another uh, group of uh, religious rituals. I should really not say next week, because actually, I believe next Wednesday we're not meeting. Uh, let me take another look. Someone just handed me this. I shouldn't be in any uncertainty about it. I'll have to just refresh my mind. Yes, next Sunday is Memorial Day. So we hope that many of you will also perhaps be in this, a little ritual of some nature, a little mysticism to tie us, perhaps with the sacrifice that others have made to help us to have a way of life. There's something about all these rituals, pageantries, and days of solemn celebration. And perhaps if we understand one, we will understand the other. All these things are part of life as a mystery. Thank you very much.